By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And also welcome to the Raging Bull series finals. Yes, because we have reached the finals and I'm so excited because this promises to be a close one. We've got two beautiful decks. We've got Leo on robots, fully powered. This is an evil, strong tier one brew. He's taking on Gideon, who's playing, I would say, aggro control, white and blue. But of course, with some splashes there as well for some other mean cards like Demonic Tutor. Um, and it is kind of line dip but there is a twist so i'm going to discuss that in the deck decks talking about that stuff if you want to skip the deck deck want to go straight to the games first the best way to do that the easiest way to do that is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps one of those timestamps reads mtg games if you click on there it will take you straight to the games and also in the description you can find more information about the raging bull series about this unique tournament that's held once a year in amsterdam and you can also find more information about the rule set the rule set by the way is swedish mtg but if you don't really know what that means please check the description below okay so we've talked about this now that means we're ready to go to the deck deck section i'm going to start with the deck of leo let's take a look at this robots brew and here we see Leo's deck. So this is robots and I, I like it. I really like this deck. It's uh, it's super powerful. Let's first look at the creature base. Like we've got four trikes, four suchis. Those are basically the creatures in there. We also see three sages of Latinam. They're quite important and one Atok. And we also see one Tetravus there. You gotta look closely, it's under the Felwer Stone, but it is in there, so that's quite interesting. Now Trike, of course, being the key creature here, what you wanna do with this deck is get your Trike out as fast as you can with your Mana Ramp, your Mana Vault, your Moxen. Once you've got it out, you start copying it with your Copy Artifact, and don't underestimate the Trike's direct damage power, right? It is a 4-4 creature, but it is, well, actually it's a 1-1 one -one creature with three plus one plus one counters on it. You can move those plus one plus one counters to deal one damage to any target. Uh, the target can also be your opponent. So if you have this scenario where you can drop it at, let's say, turn two or turn three, you can start copying it uh, like crazy, then you only need like one full swing combat damage, and then after that you can take the counters off and you can kill your opponent. This this can go really, really fast. I've seen it happen multiple times. The trike is not to be underestimated. And then, of course, if he doesn't have to trike, he can always copy his Suchis. Maybe he can even copy that single Tetravis. Um, I also like the inclusion of that one Atok, because Atok, of course, is great in a deck with this many artifacts. And Atok, of course, being the one, two creature, and you can sack an artifact to it to give it plus two, plus two until end of turn. It's super annoying to play against um, because, you know, you attack with it and you're like, okay, I don't want to block it because then he's going to sack some artifacts, kill my creature that I'm blocking with. So that's not a good thing. But if I let it go through, he can sack so many artifacts that I'm like half dead. So Atok is really this creature that can, can put you in a corner as an opponent. So it's it's really annoying to play against. Uh, I also have a soft spot for the Sage of Latinam. I think it's a beautiful creature, one blue and one for a one, two creature. Tap to sacrifice an artifact to draw a card. The cool thing about this is you can do it in response. So for example, your opponent disenchants your Suchi. In response, you can say, okay, I'm gonna tap my Sage, sack the Suchi, draw a card. So that's basically card advantage. The Sage is better than you think. I think it's going to be important for um, for Gideon to try to get rid of those sages ASAP. Okay, so this is the robots deck of uh, Leo. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent. Let's take a look at Gideon's control built. And here we see the deck of Gideon. Now when you look at this, this is basically a line dip deck, right? Because we see Surrender Perfreed and we see Savannah Alliance. And of course, you know, that whole package of Swords to Plows here is Disenchants. But there are also a few cards that we don't see. For example, we don't see any counter spells. We also see that Gideon has chosen to go more creature heavy. He's added four Suchis. He's added two Sarah Angels. And then there's this interesting part in the deck that I really, really like. He's added two Armageddons and two Land Taxes. Now, this is just super surprising, right? Because I think you don't expect these cards. When people usually go for a Land Tax strategy, they decide to put three Land Tax in there at least and to kind of build the whole deck around it. The thing is with Gideon, he's not really deep into Lantex, but he has it. And the moment that you have an active Lantex, it is just so good. And I think that's something that Gideon really understood and therefore decided to just put, you know what, I'm just gonna put two Lantex in, why not? Armageddon, that is a card that, you know, back in, at, at the start when I started playing Old School Magic in the current form, which is about five years ago, 
um, people would build a whole deck around Armageddon, right? Urnum Geddon, White Weenie with Geddons. Um, and lately, the last two years or so, there is this trend where you play with Armageddon as a one-off, or in this case, as a two-off, because as soon as you're in front on the board with your creatures, you can time an Armageddon, and then you can probably get the game, right? I mean, it's it's Armageddon is such a good card when you're ahead on board, you know, because you've got more creatures, more powerful creatures, then you can play Armageddon. I think Armageddon fits in perfectly in this deck because uh, Savannah Lions and Surrender Perfreet are both pretty low on curve. Suchi is pretty low on curve. He's playing with all the, all the mana rocks, you know, all the Moxin and stuff. So he can easily get his mana out quickly, get a Sarah Angel quickly, and then just wipe the board with an Armageddon. So I think it's really good to when you build a deck to kind of combine multiple strategies. So it's not just aggro, it's not just control. No, there's also this kind of combo element almost in it with, with your land text and Armageddon package. I also like the uh, the sideboard, the three ivory tower on the sideboard against vices. You know, that could be super annoying when you play, play land text yourself. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm liking this deck. I think it's very well balanced. It's not, not just line dip. It, it's got some more layers. It's got some more depth. So I really like that. And the fact that it's in the finals kind of proves how good this mix is of these kind of cards. We all know these are good cards, but then the, the question is, how are you going to combine them? How are you going to puzzle them together? So big compliment here to Gideon, who is, by the way, a local player. He is from Amsterdam, so he is representing the city here in the finals. As you may know, the Reggie Bull series is an event that is held in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. So it's always nice to see a local making it all the way to the finals. Now we've looked at the deck of Leo. We've looked at the deck of Gideon. So let's go to the finals. Game number one of the finals of the Raging Bull series. Here we go. We've got Leo on the play. He's on the left. He's on robots. Blue, black, and red, I believe. And then we have Gideon on the other side of the table. He's playing white and blue. Aggro control and also with land taxes, as we can see here. An explosive turn one of both of these players. Look at that. Leo deciding not to play out of land, but go for a Suchi on the first turn. There we see the untap here by Gideon drawing a card. Cannot use the land tax. Is he going to play out of land? I think that's the swords. Exactly. Sourcing the Suchi. So four life for Leo. And I'm, I guess he's not going to play out of land either. Why would he? Passing the turn here. There are damage from the mana vault for Leo. Going to drop to 23. And this is difficult for Leo, right? What do you do? You don't want to activate the tax, but if you don't, you're going to take one damage a turn. Is that what you want? I think both players are kind of hoping for their Moxen. That would make it easier for them. And Leo having there, I believe, an animate dead in hand, but that's not going to help him much because the Suchi is removed from the game by the Swords to Plowshares. He also has a Shatter there, a City of Brass. There's a blue card. I can't really identify it. If it is a Sage of Lightning, he could play City of Brass and then his Sage, Sack the Vault, draw a card. Not, not immediately, of course, because the Sage is Summoning Sickness still, but the turn after that. But if he does that, of course, he activates the land tax on the side of Gideon. And that's, that's the big question here for Leo. Do you want to play out your second land? It's kind of like a stare down now. Who's going to play that first land? And Leo really in the tank here. Gonna play, pay one and gonna play a mana vault. Okay, so he had another mana vault in hand there. And there we see a soul ring into Chaos Orb. Interesting. So. Gideon also has no need to play mana. And again, a damage for Leo, gonna drop to 22. There's a Mishra's Workshop. But he doesn't have a big artifact creature like Trike or Suchi to play out with it, so he's probably not gonna play it. One of the lines of player is, if that blue card is a copy artifact, for example, he could play out copy and City of Brass, he could copy Chaos Orb, shatter the Chaos Orb on the side of Gideon, and then flip his Chaos Orb on the land tax of Gideon. That is a line of play that he can follow. If he does it, that's of course another and whole other question. And Leo, of course, taking his time. I think he has a lot of options.
Is he going to play a land? It looks like he does. Taking it back, though, I thought for a moment he was playing out the City of Brass. Really, really in the tank here. Like I said, what he could do is play City of Brass, tap City of Brass, a Mana Vault, play, uh, sorry, and, and, and his Underground Sea, play a Copy Artifact, because I do believe that's a Copy Artifact. Copy Artifact on the Chaos Orb, shatter the Chaos Orb of Gideon, and flip on the Land Tax. Let's see what he's going to do. Play a Shatter on the Soul Ring. That is an unexpected move. I didn't see that one coming. So what he's doing now, he's kind of attacking and trying to get ahead on tempo, I, I guess which he already is with the Mana Vault. Now he is activating, of course, the Land Tax of Gideon. So Gideon is happier, he can look up three basics, but he's also lost the Soul Ring. And of course, even though you have a lot of lands in hand, you can only play out one land a turn. So this is exciting stuff. So Gideon, I'm expecting him to, to play out a land here. There we see the hand of Leo. That is also a demonic tutor, by the way, in hand. That's pretty good as well. He can play that out now next turn. There we see an underground sea by Gideon. Tapping two. What can he do for two? Oh, also having a demonic tutor in hand. I guess he's going to look up Ancestral Recall. It's kind of, you know, it's it's probably the best thing to do here in, in this scenario at this point in the game. He's shuffling up again. And Leo saying it's fine. And now he probably has to discard a couple of lands. Discarding just a planes and pass turn. Okay, that's not too bad. Leo taking another damage from the Vault, going to go down to 20. Found a Mishra's Factory there. And now, again, he can play the Copy Artifact, because it is a Copy Artifact. I can see it clearly now. He can play Copy Artifact on the Chaos Orb. And then he could flip on the Orb or on the Tax. And Leo really thinking here what he wants to do. I'm really expecting him to play out that copy artifact on the Chaos Orb. And then the question is, what is he going to flip on? Because I think he's got in hand Mishra's Factory, Anime Debt, Mishra's Workshop, Demonic Tutor. That could be a good option as well for him to tutor something and a copy artifact. He could, of course, go for a Demonic Tutor play as well. But it's so tempting to copy the Chaos Orb now because Gideon is tapped out. Going through his hand again, it looks like he wants to play the Mishra's Factory. There is the Mishra's Factory. And is he, is he then going to play the Demonic or the Copy? He's going to play the Copy. Yeah, he's going to copy the Chaos Orb, indicating that now, and he's going to flip the Chaos Orb. Okay, he's going to go to 19. We're going to see the first flip of this finals here of the Raging Bull series. Or is Leo taking it back, though? No, he is. He's going to flip on the Underground Sea. Okay, that is unexpected. I did not see that coming, to be honest. But I think what he wants to do here is, again, really win it on tempo, knowing that Gideon can only play out one land a turn. He really wants to get ahead that way. And it's definitely an original choice. And time will tell if it is a good one. I do know that Leo is an absolutely star player. He's, he's very, very skilled in magic. So he probably knows what he's doing. And Gideon here shuffling up. A very surprising move by Leo. And I like it because I love being surprised because that means I can learn something from the games. So there we see a Tundra being played by Gideon. I do believe he still has an Ancestral Recall from that first Demonic, so that could be something that he can play out. Then again, why would he? Because, you know, the only thing he then does is forcing himself to discard. 
at the end of turn. So I think if he has an Ancestral, he probably wants to wait with it until the end step of, uh, of Leo's turn. I don't think he would do that main. And despite the fact that Gideon's hand is full of lands, he does have a mana problem. Tapping one white. Okay, he is going to flip here. It's going to flip on the mana vault. So he's trying to do something back to the fact that he's so far behind on mana. So he's going to flip here on the mana vault of Leo. Obviously taking his time. Second flip here in the match. There he goes. And it's a hit. Beautiful flip by Gideon. A lot of confidence there. Remember, these players have been playing Magic the Gathering the whole day, starting from 11 in the morning, and the time that this finals was played, I believe it was 8, 9. So they've been playing the whole day, and now they've been uh, there in the finals. So it's also kind of hard on your focus to make no mistakes, to make the right decisions, to not uh, miss an orb flip. So really respect for these, uh, for these players. Curious to see... What Leo is going to do, I'm expecting him here to strip a land, actually, because he's been pretty aggro on the mana base of Gideon the whole time. Going to play Demonic first, okay. That is, of course, an option to first go for Demonic. I think that he's going to, going to look up an Ancestral Recall. I think. I mean, maybe there's another option that I'm not seeing. But Ancestral is just so tempting. One blue, instant speed, three new cards. He's got the City of Brass open. He can use it straight away. His hand's kind of empty. You know, his opponent cannot counter at the moment. It's super tempting. I think he's going to go for the Ancestral. And that would mean that both players now have Ancestral Recall in hand. So there's that shuffling up again by Leo. There are the decks. He's done. Yep, there's the Ancestral Recall. So he's going to take another point of damage. Let's see what he finds. There's a Sol Ring and a Mox Emerald and a Time Walk. This is a pretty sweet Ancestral Recall, especially that Time Walk, but also that ramping up again. Now he's going to really going to, going to come out ahead. What he needs now basically is a Trike. A Trike and another copy. So he's going to play the Emerald, tap it for one. There's the Sol Ring. Remember, he didn't have a land drop yet. He can still play the Strip Mine, Strip the Tundra. That's exactly what he does here. Stripping the Tundra. There's the Ancestral Recall by his opponent, Gideon. He's going to take three cards as well. And then I guess he's going to pass the turn. So only one measly land for Gideon. There is an island there, tapping two for a Felwer Stone. Okay, so he is ramping up a little bit, trying to get back into the mana race. And remember that Felwer Stone can make any color of mana because of the City of Brass on the side of Leo. So that's kind of nice for Gideon. And Leo knows that he needs a creature. Discarding a Scrubland here on the side of Gideon and passing the turn. I wonder if Leo is going to untap the Mana Vault. He can choose to take a damage and attack with the factory. But it looks like he's, yeah, he's going to untap the Mana Vault. So not take any damage. He's on 17. Ooh, there's a trike. That is interesting. There's the workshop. Tapping six. Going to play the trike. Wow, this is so good. He's got the trike. Now he can play the time walk and he can attack next turn. This is such a good turn for Leo. Leo going to go to 16, taking on his turn again because of the time walk play. Now he wants to untap the vault. And yeah, he's going to untap the mana vault. Interesting. He's going to use his factory for that. Interesting. Could have chosen, of course, to also attack. Attacking here for four with the factory as well, I mean. But just attacking with the trike, deciding to use that factory to untap the vault. Going to put Gideon on 16, passing the turn back to Gideon. He's really behind now on board, Gideon. Has to try and do something. I find it so annoying to play against a trike because if he now plays a disenchant, for example, on the trike or a swords, he still takes damage. And remember, Leo's got an animate in hand, so then he can animate the trike. Now, of course, Gideon doesn't know this. So I wonder if he's going to play... Would there be a disenchant here? One white, 
Yeah, there's a disenchant. One white and one. So that would be three damage for Gideon here. So he's going to drop to 13. And then next turn, Leo can just get it back with the animate. It's super annoying for Gideon. And I mean, if you play old school, you know what it's like to play against a trike. They're just tough creatures to deal with. And couldn't quite see that card that he drew, but I'm expecting him to play an animate now. Okay, he's first going to attack with both of his factories, strip mine on one of them. And Gideon's going to drop to 11. There's the animate. Oh, and Gideon's life total is getting lower and lower and lower. Passing the turn here. Gideon's going to use the land tax. We see four lands on the side of Leo. City of Brass, Mishra's Workshop, Underground Sea, and Mishra's Factory. Just two lands here and a shuffle and a pass. Well, not a pass actually, but I meant uh, Leo is just tapping the deck saying it's fine. I mean, if you're, if you're Gideon, you just want to get rid of the trike, right? Okay, this can kind of work. This is actually pretty good because the Surrender Perfreed is a 3-4 flyer. Also is the Van Alliance here. Surrender Perfreed is a 3-4 flyer that uh, deals one damage to you in your upkeep. But the good news is the Trike on the side of Leo uh, has an Anime Dead on it. And Anime Dead gives the creature minus one, minus O. Oh. That means that the Trike is now a 3-4 and not a 4-4. Four, four. So that means that Gideon can block on the Surrender if Leo attacks. So that's kind of a problem for Leo here. Wants to get rid of the Surrender. Okay, that, that works. Playing a Chaos Orb. He's going to flip, I assume, on the Surrender. Yep. Going to flip on the Surrender. And there he goes. So the Surrender is gone, and that kind of opens the path for the Trike. He can, of course, also kill the Lion. Killing the Lion, attacking for four here because he's animating his factory. So it's four points of damage, and look at that life total of Gideon dropping to seven. This is really bad. I think if you're Gideon, what you want to have now is a land drop and a Sarah Angel. That would be ideal. He's got the land drop. Does he have the Sarah? He doesn't, but this is not too bad, though. It's better than nothing. Surrender on board. The fact that it's not great is that Surrender deals one damage to you during your upkeep, and he's on seven. So that's not really ideal. And remember, the trike, those two counters can also deal two points of damage. So as soon as Gideon's on two, he's basically dead with the trike still on the battlefield. And Leo just passing the turn. He's like, okay, I'm fine. You're going to drop to six. No worries. There is a card draw for Gideon. Ooh, that's a Loa. Could be useful. I don't know how many cards he's got in hand at the moment. It looks like six. I don't think he's got seven or eight. It looks like more than six. And he doesn't have an active land tax anymore? No, because he's got four lands and Leo also has four lands. So that's kind of unfortunate for Gideon because he could use the land tax to refill his hand, of course, and then activate his own Loa with that. But that's not going to work because he's got four lands and Leo's got four lands. And if he drops a Loa, he even has more lands than Leo. There we see the Library of Alexandria on the side of Gideon. The thing is, he really doesn't want to attack with the Surrender because then he opens himself up to a hit of four points. So that's not really an option. He needs another creature. And he's just passing the turn. So things are looking really good for Leo here in game number one of the finals of the Raging Bull series. I think if you're Gideon, you're praying for an angel, a Sarah angel. Because that can make so such a big difference here. I wonder if Gideon's going to seven cards next turn. I really can't see how many cards he's got in hand. If that's the case, of course, he can use his uh, Loa to dig a little deeper to try to find a card that can save him and get him back in the game. There's a pass, so he's going to go to five. And then, ooh, there's a Psyblast. That's it. If he doesn't have a counter spell, he's going to go to one. That's it. 
Oh man, that side blast. And there you can see the power of the trike, right? Trike still had two counters on it. So one was enough to kill Gideon here in game number one. So both players are going to go and dig into their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two of the finals of the Raging Bull series. One up for Leo, the player on the left, on the robots. And on the right, Gideon, who is on blue-white aggro control. And uh, let's take a look at the hand here of Leo. We see a City of Brass. We see a Mox Ruby. I think those are the only two mana sources. We do see a lot of copy artifacts, though. So you could consider keeping it. But it's kind of tough. I think the black card there is a Mind Twist. Very strong card, but if he doesn't have enough lands, anyway, he's deciding to keep it. And there's a, a land drop by Gideon and a pass, so just a basic planes. There we see a Ruby, a City of Brass tapping it. There's a Felwer Stone. So he took that Felwer Stone from the top, I believe. So that's a pretty good card to find. There's an Island from Gideon and just a pass. So no Savannah Lions, no land tax for Gideon here. Interesting there. Sage of Latnam. Could play out the Sage, maybe then start sacking some creatures. I guess a better option here is to go for Copy Artifact. Yeah, Copy Artifact and probably copying the Felwer Stone. It's not necessarily what you want to do. Yeah, and then using that to play Sage of Latinam. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. Not too bad. I mean, Leo preferably would have found just a land on the top, but it, it's not too bad. There we see a Surrendip on the side of Gideon, that's quite good. 3-4 flyer. I guess he's gonna play his Mind Twist now. I mean, it's yuck, but it's the best thing to do. Your Mind Twist for four. I wonder if Gideon's gonna keep any cards. Okay, he's gonna keep one card at least, so he can keep that one. This is bad news for Gideon though. Oh, Brain Guys are Demonic Tutor. So bad. I mean, he couldn't play out the, the, the tutor yet, but still. That's so bad. Gonna take a damage from the surrender. Drop to 19. Gonna attack. I mean, he kind of needs an ancestral recall to get back from the mind twist. Losing that brain geyser was tough, especially now that he's found a soul ring as well. And look at that hand. I, I believe I saw a trike and a suchi. Wow, the question is, is he going to go for Trike first or Suchi first? He's going to go for Trike first. Taking a damage, going to drop to 13. And this is not looking good for Gideon. He's already a game behind. And after that Mind Twist, is going to be really tough. Needs to find Ancestral Recall. Needs to get rid of the Trike here. Again, a Sarah Angel would be really good. Attacking for 3, going to put him on 10. Playing an island. And of course, he lost the Sarah Angel due to that mind twist. And I mean, things are just going really, really well for Leo so far in this final. Okay, there we see a Divine Offering. Got a card from the sideboard, probably. I really like this Divine Offering because it gives six life, six life here to Gideon. It's such a good card when you play against an artifact heavy deck. It's one of the best answers to a trike actually, in my opinion, because you also gain so much life. There is a Suchi and a copy artifact on the Suchi. So immediate pressure here for Gideon, who's gonna drop to 14 because of his own Surrendip. He's gonna attack, of course. So Leo's already on six, he's so low. But now Leo can attack for eight, nine even, if he would attack with the Sage. Attacking for eight here, I think that's a good decision, keeping the Sage untapped to respond to possible removal. It looks like he wants to sack the Felwer Stone. So he's first gonna take a mana out, then sack the Felwer Stone. Ooh, an animate dead. Oh, that is really good. He could animate, get his strike back. Oh man. Oh man, this is, this is, this is bad news. Oh, he's gonna get the Sarah. That's even better. He can use the Sarah to block the Surrendip. Wow, this is bad news for Gideon here. It's gonna drop to five. He needs something to get rid of the Sarah Angel on the side of Leo. And even then he's in trouble. He's on five life and look at the amount of creatures Leo has. It's insane. 
Is there a balance, perhaps? Time walk, okay, that is something. Ooh, if he could have had that time walk before Leo had the Sarah Angel, he would have won this game, actually. He could have attacked twice with the Surrender. Now he's going to drop to four. He needs something here. Balance would be good. What can he find? Control magic, perhaps? Nope, he doesn't have anything. Leo is winning this one. And Gideon, you were so, so close with the time walk. If, you know, if Leo with that sack of the flower stone hadn't found the anime dead, you would have won. It's, it's well, one, it would have been 1-1 one, one, and we would have had a third game. It can be so insanely close in old school magic, which is one of the reasons why I love the format so much. These decks or so extremely close. It was such an exciting tournament and an exciting finals. A big thank you goes out to Richard for organizing the Raging Bull series. Here you can see his website. Please take a moment to visit and have a look and read about this magnificent tournament. Also a big thank you to Dion. Thank you so much Dion for all the equipment, for the whole setup, for the whole day. I mean, it was fantastic. Because of you, we have this beautiful, beautiful footage. So thank you so much for that. And of course, thank you for watching another video right here on Timmy Talks. And before you go, I would like to ask you to do three things. Please like the video, comment on the video and share it on your socials. All these things are completely free and really help the channel move forward. And also please take a look at the Timmy Talks Patreon page because via the Patreon page, you can support the channel. You can support me as a content creator. It already starts with just $1 a month. And you know, it is just such a big help. Just that $1 can really help me continue doing what I love to do, which is make these movies for you guys. Anyway, that's all that I wanted to share. So now let's take a look at our fantastic, amazing, wunderbar patrons and channel members. Let's take a look at the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? 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 Somebody can see.